Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Tuesday, the 3rd of June. You're tuned in to our mid morning newscast here on Adidang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Korea's two main political parties are stepping up their appeals to the public and their attacks on each other as we head into the final day of campaigning before the June 4th local elections. South Korea and the United States are seeking ways to reopen multinational talks on North Korea's denuclearization amid concerns over disharmony after Japan forged its own deal with Pyongyang. Plus, hundreds of former comfort women and their relatives protest outside Japan's parliament, demanding Tokyo sincerely atone for its wartime system of sex slavery. But our top story this morning, in just 20 hours from now, some 13,000 polling booths around Korea will open for citizens to cast their votes in the June 4th local elections. The country's rival political parties are engaged in one final push to win the hearts of undecided voters on this Tuesday, which is the last day of the 13-day campaigning period. Safety issues and measures to address them continue to be the main focus of campaigns in light of last month's tragic Sewol Ho ferry sinking. These elections are increasingly being seen as a vote of confidence for the Puck and Hay administration. The ruling Senate party is calling on the public to give them one more chance to revamp and reform the government in the wake of the ferry disaster. The main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, is calling on voters to hold the ruling party responsible for the government's poor handling of the tragedy. Polling stations open at 6 a.m. on Wednesday and close at 6 p.m. And, of course, we'll be bringing you all the latest updates throughout the day. Now, staying with domestic politics, but at the nation's top office, President Park Geun-hye has asked her aides to make sure the delayed appointment of a new prime minister has no effect on state affairs. At a meeting of her senior secretaries on Monday, President Park said her push for sweeping reforms in the public sector can only be achieved when politicians and high-ranking officials lead the way. Introducing her new security adviser, former Defence Minister Kim Guan Jin, the Korean leader then asked him to focus on establishing a security posture and preparing for North Korean provocations. Meanwhile, on government restructuring, the president said the duties of the National Emergency Management Agency and current security ministry will be transferred to the soon-to-be-established safety ministry, which will handle both man-made and natural disasters. The chief nuclear envoys of South Korea and the United States have discussed how to bring the so-called six parties back to negotiations to denuclearize North Korea. Following the talk, South Korean negotiator Hwang Jung-guk said the two sides reaffirmed their stance that they, along with the international community, will strongly respond to further provocations by the North. As for the long-stalled six-party talks, Washington maintained that Pyongyang's intent to denuclearize must be confirmed before returning to the negotiations. This comes after the Chinese foreign minister asked South Korea to push to restart the talks ahead of Chinese President Xi Jinping's expected visit to Seoul this month. South Korea has rejected a North Korean request to return two North Korean fishermen who drifted in a boat across the maritime border last weekend. Three fishermen in their 20s and 30s were picked up by the South Korean Coast Guard near Ulungdo Island on Saturday. Two of the three say they want to stay in South Korea and Seoul's Unification Ministry says the two men who want to stay will be able to do so. The third man is expected to be repatriated through the Truce village of Panmunjom sometime on this Tuesday. Now, the previously icy relations between North Korea and Japan appear to be thawing, evidenced by Pyongyang agreeing to open an investigation into the fate of Japanese citizens it kidnapped in the 1970s and 80s. But what does this mean for South Korea? Uh, Hwang sang yi sat down with an expert to find out. Dialogue between North Korea and Japan could be a chance for Pyongyang to blunt cooperation among South Korea, the United States and Japan. 
In an interview with Arirang News, Professor Kent Calder of Johns Hopkins University said it's important for Tokyo to refrain from making any separate arrangements. Uh, the, the heart of cooperation, of course, is the, US, the Korea and uh, ROK and the United States. But uh, as a supportive element, Japan could be valuable. And so I think our three countries don't, can't afford to see North Korea drive a wedge there. Uh, that said, uh, generally, I think some pattern of dialogue, as long as there's coordination behind the scenes among the allies, is important. Professor Calder said dialogue is key to bringing back Japanese citizens kidnapped by North Korea in the 1970s and 80s. Five Japanese abductees were returned in 2002, but the fate of several others remains unknown. In other words, there could well be uh, Japanese citizens still alive in, in North Korea who never will be able to come home if there's not uh, some process of dialogue. Once fresh investigations begin on the Japanese abductees, Tokyo has promised to lift sanctions and to reconsider humanitarian aid to the north, reducing Pyongyang's dependence on Beijing. Professor Calder said the possible breakthrough is also a rare diplomatic achievement for Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, under whom Japan has seen ties sour with China and South Korea. I think we're at a, a period where the Abe administration realizes that it uh, can't be a player on Northeast Asian uh, geopolitical issues without uh, some uh, kind of contact or dialogue with uh, DPRK. Well, there has been Japan-North Korea talks, and Washington has also been conducting 1.5-track informal dialogue with North Korea. Uh, doesn't that leave South Korea out of the picture? Well, it's very important that uh, South Korea not be left out of the picture. That's absolutely the case. I've felt strongly for a long time that uh, the credibility of the uh, Korea-U.S. alliance is really the cornerstone of our position uh, in the Pacific and, and one of the key global elements. Professor Calder stressed the importance of dialogue, but said quiet consultations between Seoul, Washington and Tokyo must remain intact at any cost. Hwang sang Arirang News. Now, a former senior U.S. State Department official has endorsed Tokyo's push to exercise collective self-defense, citing growing security threats posed not only by North Korea, but China in the Asia-Pacific region. Meeting with Japanese officials and the ruling coalition in Tokyo, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, Kirk Campbell, said Washington believes individual self-defense and police authority are not enough to handle new forms of threat in the region. The right of uh, collective self-defense allows a country to take military action if an ally is attacked. Campbell stressed the U.S. needs to boost defense ties with its two major allies, South Korea and Japan, whose bilateral relations are extremely strained over Tokyo's historic denials. And while we're on historic denials, hundreds of former comfort women and their families gathered in Tokyo on Monday to demand Japan formally atone for sexual slavery in its wartime military brothels. And now elderly women and activists working on their behalf want a full and frank apology and compensation for the victims. Connie Kim reports. Victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery from eight countries rallied in front of the Japanese Diet's lower house on Monday, calling on politicians in the country to settle the unresolved issue. On the sidelines of the 12th Asian Solidarity Meeting in Tokyo, around 300 former comfort women, their families and civic activists showed up for the demonstration, along with foreign embassy officials from 18 countries. Today's rally, there were grandmothers who visited Japan for the first time to speak about the horrific atrocities they have experienced. The Korean Council said that the participants submitted an appeal asking Tokyo to acknowledge that Japan set up and administered military brothels during World War II. They're seeking an apology and compensation for the victims and that future generations are educated about the historical atrocity so that it never occurs again. It was another opportunity to push the Japanese government to acknowledge their past wrongdoings and provide compensation through legal means. 
Following the public protest, victims will speak in front of seven universities in Tokyo on Tuesday and Wednesday to inform the younger generations that are unaware of Japan's history. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion the Obama administration has announced an ambitious plan to significantly reduce carbon emissions in the U.S. plant sector. Supporters of the plan say it will give Washington greater leverage to push countries like China and India to do more to fight climate change. Our Che Yusan reports. But today, today EPA is proposing a clean power plan that will cut carbon pollution from our power sector by using clean energy sources and cutting energy waste. The Obama administration's new plan requires America's 1,000 power plants to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions to 30 percent of 2005 levels by the year 2030. Nearly two-fifths of electricity in the U.S. is generated by coal-fueled plants. Each U.S. state has a number of ways to achieve this. They can increase their power plant's heat rates, rely more on natural gas or other sources for energy, and raise energy efficiency. The Environmental Protection Agency says more than 90 billion U.S. dollars of climate and health-related costs will be saved from the plan, and up to 150,000 asthma attacks in children and over 3,000 heart attacks could be prevented. Often these illnesses are aggravated by air pollution, pollution from the same sources that release carbon and contribute to climate change. We've got to do more to reduce it. Despite the government's assurances that the new rules will bring down electricity bills by 8 percent and encourage investment in new technologies, business groups and lawmakers from coal-reliant states oppose the initiative. The administration has set out to kill coal and its 800,000 jobs. If it succeeds in death by regulation, we'll all be paying a lot more money for electricity after a period of public comment, the regulations will be finalized in June of next year, after which states can submit their own carbon reduction plans. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. Now, staying with some economic news, in a poll of 33 global investment banks and credit rating agencies has found that, on average, they think the Korean economy will grow slightly over 3.6% this year. The Bloomberg poll result is lower than the 3.9% forecast by Korea's finance ministry and the 4% forecast by Korea's central bank. But it's worth noting that one-third of these firms revised up their forecasts from earlier this year. This suggests that they don't believe last month's Seoul Ho Ferry disaster is going to have a lasting impact on the Korean economy. And Korea's economic policymakers have been tasked with boosting domestic demand after the recent Sewol Ho ferry disaster. But a visiting professor from Harvard University says there's no real need for the government to intervene. Our Huang Jie reports. Exports have been Korea's traditional growth engine, but balancing it with domestic demand rose as one of the key agendas for the Park Geun-hye administration to boost growth. The Korea Development Institute has even pointed out that the sluggish domestic demand is largely the reason behind the nation's strong current account surplus. One renowned economist, Robert Barrow, however, stands against the argument, saying it's not that big of a concern. With uh, Korea having become so rich now, I would expect imports to be catching up with exports and exports and imports to grow. Um, Fairly much uh, together. He added that the deadly ferry disaster in April will have a temporary impact on the domestic economy and that the nation's pace of economic growth is strong enough. Those, Professor Barrow said, all take away reasons for the government to intervene. But still, the recent growth around 3 4 percent is, is pretty good in a world perspective. So, again, I don't see this as a rationale for government intervention. Uh, further into the macro economy, for example, in the form of further monetary stimulus or 
fiscal stimulus. Over on the recent strong Korean won trend, Barrow said the government allowing further appreciation of the exchange rate is reasonable. And I would allow further appreciation of the exchange rate, which I think has appreciated to some extent uh, over the last uh, few years. But he went on to say that the current level of the won against the U.S. dollar hovering around the 1,020 level could be the point where the local currency stops strengthening. Hong Jie, Arirang News. Now, the divide between large and small companies is widening here in Korea. The Korea Exchange said on Monday that the combined net profit of firms listed on the main bourse increased 4.6% on year in the first quarter, while their overall operating income fell 1.5%. But the numbers tell a different story when only taking the top 10 companies into account. They saw a rise in both figures over the same period accounting for over 65 percent of the total operating income during the January to March period. That's compared with just under 61 percent last year. In terms of net profit, however, the top 10 companies made up 67.6 percent of the total. That's well up from 62.4 percent. And that racks up, of course, a bigger portion as well. Koreans work some of the longest hours in the developed world, so you'd hope retirement would at least bring some well-deserved rest. But, unfortunately, a new OECD report shows that the average Korean is still punching the clock, still going to work more than 10 years after the official retirement age. Our Song ji reports. In Korea, you might retire from your main job, but that doesn't mean you're no longer working. That's the picture painted by the OECD's latest report on effective retirement age. The report notes the effective age of retirement is well below the official age for receiving a full pension in most countries. Some countries like Korea stick out, as while the official retirement age is 60, the effective age of retirement is over 70 for men. In many European countries, Residents are actually retiring a good few years before their official retirement age of 65. Women in general retire a year or two earlier than men, but Korean women are also the ones working the longest after retirement, trailing only Chile. Korean women are working just as many years as men, effectively retiring at 70. Analysts say the figures clearly indicate how many Koreans cannot live on their pensions or savings alone, so they have to search for a new job in their golden years. Government data shows more than half of Korean men in their 60s were economically active last year, with 29 percent of women in the same age group taking part in economy. Song ji Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following at this hour. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, who's standing by at the news centre. Good morning, as always, to you, Eunice. Now, police in Nigeria are banning protests in the capital city of Abuja. That's right, Mark. The Nigerian commissioner explained the protest ban as necessary to respond to the, quote, serious security threat posed to people around the demonstration sites in Abuja. In a statement recently released, he said he could no longer fold his hands and watch the lawlessness. The group Bring Back Our Girls had been holding rallies in the capital city, calling on the government to locate and rescue the kidnapped Chibok schoolgirls, those missing still numbering at more than 200. 50 days after their abduction now. A lawyer for Bring Back Our Girls, which had also sparked a global Twitter campaign by the same name, said the decision to ban protests was insane and illegal, adding that the group would challenge the move in court. Violence continues to flare up in eastern Ukraine, where hundreds of pro-Moscow separatists try to overrun a Ukrainian border guard, triggering an exchange of fire for hours. It happened in the region of Luhansk, where military personnel were flown in to assist in staving off the assault. Ukraine's border service said at least five militants were killed and eight others wounded, while seven border guards were hurt from sniper fire. 
Meanwhile, leaders of Western governments, including those from the U.S., Britain, and France, are set to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin this coming Friday. The occasion to mark the 70th anniversary of the D Day landings is expected to be overshadowed by discussions on how to defuse tensions within Ukraine. A powerful sandstorm quickly shifted from irritating to deadly as it wreaked havoc in Tehran. Enormous dust clouds engulfed Iran's capital city as a wall of sand and tossed debris reduced visibility, triggering traffic accidents and cutting power. State-run Irna News Agency reported at least four people were killed and 30 others injured. Some domestic flights were diverted as well. Winds riling up to 110 kilometers per hour were recorded as residents told of darkness descending upon the city. King Juan Carlos of Spain has announced he intends to step down, paving the way for his 45-year-old son, Crown Prince Philippe, to take over the throne. In a televised address to the nation, the 76-year-old king said while he looked back on his 40-year reign with pride and gratitude, a new generation, people with new energies, must be at the forefront. Juan Carlos had been a largely popular monarch, but recent scandals involving his daughter and her husband, uh, their alleged business irregularities, and an elephant hunting trip he took amidst Spain's financial crisis had dented the country's confidence in the monarchy. Carlos became king in 1975 following the death of dictator general Francisco Franco and is honored for standing up against a military coup for democracy in 1981. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off in the LPGA, where after three days of the ShopRite LPGA Classic, Pagan B is no longer the number one LPGA golfer. Despite a strong first day of the event, shooting a 66 on the day, Pagan B struggles a bit and finishes tied for eighth after three rounds of the event. Meanwhile, Stacey Lewis had a strong second day of the event after shooting a 63, held on to claim the title after shooting a 16 under par. With the title finish, Stacey Lewis takes over the number one ranking while Pagan B's streak comes to an end after 59 consecutive weeks. And staying in golf, but over to the PGA Memorial Tournament where Korean-American Kevin Na came very close to winning the event but fell short in the playoff. Now Kevin Na stormed through the final round of the Memorial Tournament, shooting a 64 and tied with Japan's Hideki Masuyama at 13 under par overall. But it was Masuyama who takes the title with a par in the playoff hole, winning his first American title. For Kevin Nye, was as close as it can get, but still finished runner-up. And moving over to football, where Park Ji Sung held his Asian Dream Cup 2014 charity football match on Monday in Jakarta, Indonesia. Now, quite an entertaining match for all the fans out there, as some of the biggest names in the Korean entertainment industry took part in the charity match. And even Park Ji Sung was quite surprised to find out that Cha Bung Gun got some playing time as the South Korean legend subbed in at the 78th minute. And a match that also included Jean Luc Zambrota, the Indonesian All Stars, won the match 3 to 2. And now with that finishing things off in baseball with a KBO named the MVP for the month of May. And it was none other than Park Byung Ho of the Nexon Heroes. After a monster month hitting 321 with 14 home runs, 27 RBIs, and 26 runs scored, the Nexon Heroes first baseman received 14 out of a possible 26 votes and was named the month's MVP. The slugger who's won back-to-back -back league MVPs is currently hitting 309 and is currently leading the league with 21 home runs. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Good morning. Well, lingering rain clouds are dropping showers on most areas. It's another cloudy day today with rain shower. And depends on where you are, rain could be heavy or light at times, but it seems like southeast areas will receive the most rainfall of up to 80 millimeters, while the Seoul metro areas will see 5 to 20 millimeters of showers. And this rain is dragging down the temperatures. It will be cooler than yesterday, hovering low 20s across the region. So please dress accordingly. But temperatures will jump up to warm side again tomorrow to the upper 20s, but it won't be as hot as last week here in the capital, staying below 30 degrees Celsius under mostly to partly cloudy skies. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. Behind the capital will rise to 24, while Taeguan puts on top of the 21, and Gwangju should climb to 23 later on. Now for other regions, down on Jeju and uh, uh, Jeju should see a high of 25, and Daejeon and Dukdo will reach 23 and 22, while Mount Gyeonggang tops out at 13. Well, that's all for now, but I'll be back with more updates after noon. Well, that's all for now. We'll be back for another newscast at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.